Hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Brad Huddleston Ministries. I've just been so looking forward to this interview. My special guest is Jim Ramos. And Jim, um, this book of yours, Strong Men, Dangerous Times, Five Essentials Every Man Must Possess to Change His World, needs to get into the hands of as many men as possible. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on the show. And I really appreciate that great compliment, man. It's You put a book out there and you expose yourself to the world and you never know what they're going to say. <laughs> well, you, you definitely did that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we all, you have to, if you're going to be real and authentic, and that's one of the things I love about you. Tell me, Jim, what, um, well, before we dive into it, I've known you somewhat, at least in this medium, you read my book, I read yours and mm -hmm. I've been privileged to be on your podcast. Uh, and I was just so tempted to dive right into this interview, but just for those in my audience who haven't had the privilege of meeting you, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're over on the left coast. Um, yeah, I am. You're, you're, you're fighting the good fight of faith. So tell us about where you're from. Tell us about your, your marriage and all that good stuff. Yeah, I actually uh, was born and raised in a small little town uh, in the middle of California, the central coast of California, San Luis Obispo. Grew up there, did ministry there till about age 38. I was a youth pastor, moved up to Oregon, so stayed on the left. Moved up to Oregon. We've been up here since 2003. And in 2012, God called us out of uh, church, local church ministry. Uh, although I'm very involved in my local church, but called us out of the local church ministry in, and started a parachurch ministry for men called, uh, at that time, The Great Hunt for God. And uh, God has blessed our ministry. We've, in the last, well, we just had our 10th year anniversary celebration. So for a nonprofit crowdfunded organization, we're super excited about what God has done and really, really excited about what God is going to do. Jim, I am uh, just been so encouraged. I uh, haven't seen anything like your Facebook feed. Uh, the men that you are ministering to, you probably don't know most of them because you have so many. Yeah. But the transparency that you allow and you model they have felt so free to just uh, open up and, I mean, share the raw, the dirty, the sinful, the current sinful state, which is so encouraging because we can't get help until we we are broken like that before God. And what in the world are you doing to cause that kind of reaction in, in your ministry with these men? Well, it's really it, – well, honestly, my generation, our generation, I think the generations beneath us, they're done being told by a hero what they need to do. What they want is they want to be the hero in their story, and they just want somebody to guide them along the journey. That's what we're doing. I'm coming along. You know, I'm 56 years old. I'm reaching down into these guys that are living in the stress bubble of life. These guys are 30 years old to 50. They're raising kids. So I'm reaching down to those guys and saying, hey, guys, here's what we've learned along the way. And to do that, it's been very, very difficult and a, a tough journey, but we've had to go down and learn how to reach those guys through the digital market. And that's been quite challenging. But uh, here's a fun example for you, Brad. You'll love this. I just was told that, that we have a TikTok video that's at 206,000 views. And it was funny because I didn't even know I had TikTok. So, <laughs> you know, so we're doing the, I have a great digital marketing person. I've got a great operations guy. Uh, we've got a team of people that is really helping us to reach that generation down there and help these guys with a very, very difficult thing. How do I navigate uh, through my marriage? How do I deal with my children through this digital age, which your book, Digital Co uh, Cocaine, was a wonderful, wonderful book. I love that book. You know, How do we do those things? So we're targeting that guy. Well, you're doing it well. Talk about men in the arena. Um, I've been putting your web address up there, but I said this, to you before, I think in an email, men need to get to know you. And I'll tell you why I get to speak at a lot of men's conferences like you do yeah. and, and they're all good, but what sets yours apart and not everyone needs this, but I think most do, especially if they've been dealing with porn, their marriage is a wreck. Um, they can open up and be so raw uh, yeah. with what you're doing. So talk about men in the arena and how people can find you. Yeah, uh, we're pretty easy to find. We've got a pretty large uh, following on Instagram, TikTok. And uh, if it's not men in the arena, you can search the men in the arena. Either one of those will get you onto our social media platforms. We've got the men in the arena podcast, which is just ranked number one on Spotify for Christian men. We've got the Facebook forum, 
with about 12,000 guys in it. And so we're just trying to reach these guys digitally, but we're trying to move them into a small group setting. That's really our go-to. Our desire is to get 100% of these guys in some kind of small group where they can be accountable with other dudes. So we want to move them from the digital realm into this uh, local face-to-face -face world, if at all possible. Jim, I would like to, uh, you know, announce your book to folks uh, because they need they need to read it. And Thank I'm going to put some quotes that were sure. Um, I, I, I want folks to get this because of what I've been saying. I, yeah. I, I just can't say enough how raw you are, real. And that's what resonates. Uh, finally, in the body of Christ, we don't have to use King James English. We can just be <laughs> men yeah. and be full redneck. Uh, I mean, look, we can't sin. I'm not saying that. You know me better than that. But at the yeah. same time, if you if you've got a problem, you need to talk about it. So the, the book looks like this. Uh, Strong men, dangerous times, five essentials. Every man. I can't get in front of the camera. Uh, five essentials. Every man must possess in order to change his world. So here's what we're going to do, Jim. I'm just going to put some quotes up there and I would like for you to elaborate. These are some of my favorite quotes and I couldn't even get to a fraction of them, but, but let's yeah. get started. A strong man is one who will carry heavy burdens, withstand great pressures and move threatening obstacles, tangible or intangible that threaten those in his sphere of influence. Talk about that. Yeah, that's that's really good. Well, first of all, thanks for reading the whole book, man. Most guys don't read the books. They just kind of interview about the book. So I appreciate that. It honors me. You know, uh, when I, I think of that picture, I think of a buck I shot two years ago. Biggest buck of my life. I was alone. I was four miles or four hours from the four hours driving to the closest town. I was an hour from the closest cell service and my buddies were off hunting. I was alone. And so in 100 degree weather, I had to bone this buck out, put him on my back. And over I was 54 years old at the time. I had my rifle, my spotting scope. I had the biggest buck of my life. I had his front shoulders, his his back hams, his loins. I mean, I had about 150 pounds on and I was dying. And it was bad. It was so bad that day. I wore the treads off on my boots and the company replaced them for free. And <laughs> as I'm as I'm carrying this load, suffering, suffering tremendously, thinking my hamstrings were going to snap, I realized, you know, men are are created by God to carry heavy loads. That is what we do. We die. Uh, we die typically earlier than our spouses. We carry heavy loads. We are in the stress bubble when we're raising our families. We are, that is the mantle God has given us. He's given us to handle the pressure of the bubble, to carry that weight, to carry that burden for our, our wife, our children, uh, to provide for them, to preside over them, to protect them. It's a huge, huge burden. We do that with our wives but ultimately God will call the man to account for how well he did that during that time. And I believe that with all my heart. I do too, Jim. And you communicate that so well. Let's go to the next uh, quote. One of my favorites from the book, strong men are interlopers who cross the lines. Their adversaries draw. I love that. I got to read that. Again. <laughs> strong men are interlopers who cross the lines. Their adversaries draw, push back darkness and take new ground. Talk about it. Yeah, I've been really into disrupting people lately. I like to disrupt their their routines. Uh, one of the things I've been doing is whenever I have a, a waiter or a waitress, I ask their name before the meal comes. And when the meal comes, I say, hey, listen, I'm going to pray for my food. Now, I'm going to tip them 20% off the top. That's You need to know that's got to happen. But I want them to know I'm more than a nice guy and more than a 20% tipper. So I say to these people, I will, I'm going to pray for you by name because I pray for my food. What can I pray for you for? And so I kind of, I disrupt their life and I disrupt their expectations because maybe that little moment, I've had some amazing God stories in those little moments with a waiter or waitress. And so even that little disruption is my way of pushing back the darkness. It's my way of saying, I'm going to be an interloper. I'm going to trespass into the boundaries of this person's life because they need more Jesus. They need Jesus. And so we live in a culture that has been quiet. It's gone dark. Our Christian culture, we've we've allowed all these other voices to creep in and dominate our culture. And we've just gone silent because we're afraid to disrupt. We're afraid to trespass into other people's spirits. And, and that's exactly what God tells us to do when Jesus said, you are salt, you are light. He's, he's saying to us, you are holy disruptors. You are holy interlopers. And so he calls us 
to do that. And so our children actually see that. And they we have generation after generation of interlopers who are pushing back the darkness. I want to run something past you. Um, yeah. We we had when I was on your podcast, we we really we acted like men, at least what I what I would define as a man. <laughs> I run this past you. And I want you as a brother, really as an accountability brother, I want you to yeah. feel free to repeat me. We we have a, a group here called City Elders that I'm one of the uh leaders for, two two of us, where we have several now, but two of us started it. It's political. Uh we we are 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 doing everything everything we can to restore our county, our state, and our nation spiritually, civically, and the business community mm-hmm. as well. But we had an attorney in to talk to us about all these issues about CRT, you know, all these crazy things that are going on. So what the legal ramifications of us doing uh-huh. this and that and that. So I, I asked actually asked the attorney, I said, okay, here's my question. Be an attorney for me. If my wife, we're at Target, and my wife goes into the ladies' room. And some guy goes in there and he says, well, I'm a woman now. And he exposes himself to her. And I go in there and knock his teeth out. What's going to happen to me? (laughs) And I already knew the answer. And he's like, well, you'll get in trouble, you know. So uh, just as a little rabbit trail here is as a man, is it okay for me to want to protect my wife if I even have to knock somebody's teeth out over it? Okay. So I'm going to go back one step and then I'll answer that question. So you you mentioned CRT. So for our listeners, that's critical race theory, social justice. And so we need to realize the first and foremost thing before we start hanging our BLM signs and hanging our rainbow flags, CRT, critical race theory, is is a religion. It's a worldview that Mm -hmm. is in the middle of a revival in this country, probably the world. And so it is in a revival because Christians are being silent. So we have to push back the darkness and expose this for what it is. It is a worldview. It is religion. We are combating not not colored people, people of color, not homosexuals, not people who are, you know, trans transgender, whatever they are. We're combating the darkness that is deceiving. These are not people that are the enemy. They're just deceived by the enemy and they need us to come along and disrupt them. So with that being said, I, I just preached a message on this with a group of men called the, that we are called to protect. So I do not believe personally that turn the other cheek. If you look at that turn the other cheek discourse in Matthew chapter five, I think where Jesus says, when you, when you, nine times he says, when you, when you, when you, when you, he's talking directly to me. When I, when this happens to me, I am to turn the other cheek. But what's interesting is he also tells us in the same book to take a sword up. So I believe we have to interpret the turn the other cheek discourse like this. When I am persecuted for my faith, I am to turn the other cheek. I am to allow persecution for my faith. I am to invite it. I am to pray for it. I am to rejoice over it. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, for the godly in Christ will be persecuted. So for my faith, I will gladly take the slap on the face. I will gladly take the nail in the cross. I have a biblical obligation as God's steward to protect my body. And I will defend my body against an attacker in every circumstance except my faith. And I am also called, if you read the Bible over and over again through the Old Testament and the Jewish people, you didn't have to explain this to the ancient readers. They just understood this. God's heart is to protect the weak, the powerless, the the little children, the orphans. Our call as men is to protect those weaker than us. So when we see anybody being harmed who is less than or less not as strong as us or weaker or powerless, whether it be an unborn baby, a little child, a homeless guy on the streets, we have a biblical mandate, whether it be our wife, whoever is getting harmed, who is weaker than the bully, we are called to stand up and defend against the bully, even if it means getting physical. I believe that with all my heart. Me too, obviously. And I wasn't doing that, Jim, uh, out of context either. I, I agree with your context. In other words, 100%. If, if if somebody's persecuting me because I love Jesus, I'm going to take that one. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Uh, but if it's just nonsense and it's just lunacy and it's mental illness um, trying to get me to play along in some fantasy land, I'm not going to do that. And I say that because 
a lot of guys, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir with you, but I'm actually yeah. talking to men here. Yeah. They feel like that if they come to church, they have to, you know, put on, put lace on their underwear all of a sudden. Yeah. And uh, a lot of churches would have you think that, but not, not in our world, not in the biblical world. We don't agree with that. You agree with that? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, for some reason we think that to be a Christian means we now have to be nice well, the word nice is nowhere found in the Bible. The word nice, the original Latin word, comes from the word to ignore. And so uh, a, a nice guy will turn. I'm not going to step in when that little child is getting hit by an adult, beaten by an adult, not spanked, but beaten by an adult, or that homeless guy is getting kicked by some idiot or whatever. For me to turn the other cheek and walk away is being nice. It's to ignore the problem. A true man, a biblical man, a strong man does not ignore any problem when it involves somebody of with more power violating someone with less power. He has a biblical mandate to step in and be and be an interloper in that situation and to step into this zone and to take some take charge whether that be a a, a thread that's a, a, be, a, a bully thread on the internet whether that's um, on the streets most cowards nowadays are doing it behind the computer screens so that's where it will happen but wherever it is God's men need to step forward and protect others against the bully. Amen. All right. Well, let's let's go back to your book, which is awesome. Um, I have another quote that I want to read from this, uh, Jim. And here it is. When a man doesn't get it, everyone around him is in danger. His world is always on the brink of crashing down on those who love him the most. Those who have been damaged by his choices to remain an immature boy are left to suffer in the wake of his life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I think the first thing here, Brad, is there are two species out there that have a male genitalia. One is a man and one is a male. And so there is a difference between a male or a man. You may be a 50-year-old male disguised or masquerading as a man. And so that's what we're talking about here. You know, our culture has labeled this phrase, again, this is a CRT phrase, but toxic masculinity. So that phrase is an attack against masculinity. But if you look at the dictionary, dictionary is uh, for masculinity is um, doing manly things. So toxic masculinity is actually an oxymoron. A man, a true man is not toxic. When a true man gets it, it solves a lot of the world problems. But when a man, a male doesn't get it, it creates a wake of destruction, divorce, adultery, uh, sex trafficking, on and on and on and on and on. Our culture is very quick to say toxic masculinity when a, when a male hurts other people. And I agree that males are the problem, but men are the solution. That's where and we can't say one is the problem without saying that same thing as the solution, right? And so if my gun is broken, the solution is fix the gun. It's the same thing with masculinity. If masculinity is broken, we have to fix masculinity. If we fix masculinity, everything around that man, his world will change. When a man gets it, everyone wins. Amen to that. Next quote. Yep. Figuratively, posture is affected by the presence or absence of my integrity. Integrity allows me to live upright and in full view of others without fear, hesitation, or doubt. It's to live in full confidence that the world can experience the best version of me, that the public and private me are the same man. Yeah, that last sentence is massive. And so I go back to Adam and Eve in the garden. So Adam is the prototypical male. Can you imagine what he must have looked like? I mean, he was he must have been ripped, yoked. I mean, he would that guy was a stud. You know, he'd walk, the striations, his legs are popping. His, you know, chest muscles, the striations, you can see this guy's a stud, right? Walking up, he's the he is the only species in the garden that walks upright with his sex organs exposed. He's with he has no shame. He's walking upright with no shame. And so is Eve. She's can you imagine what she looked like? I don't want the guys to get too nervous there, but I mean gorgeous, walking fully upright, sex organs exposed. As soon as sin enters the world, you see the prototypical male and female sowing fig leaves, bent over in shame, covering themselves up from each other, husband and wives covering from each other. And then God comes on the scene 
and 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 then give and then kills an animal because something has to die when sin is involved and covers them with uh, with animal skin. So the picture here is when when we have a breach of our integrity, it causes shame, it causes guilt, it causes secrets, it causes us from walking fully exposed to the world to being hunched over and hiding. And you know this with your book, Digital Cocaine. You understand this. But God wants us to walk fully exposed, open book, open and vulnerable to the world to see and understand who the real us is. And so the goal for us as men, for me as a man, is that the public Jim Ramos and the private Jim Ramos are the same guy. And that, again, is the the very definition of integrity. Yeah. Um, Jim, where can folks find your, your books? I mean, anywhere. Book, well, you've written yeah, quite a yeah, number of Yeah, we've written several books. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, it, they can go to our website at menarena.org, which you've been showing on the screen there, which I appreciate. They can go to Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. They're all over the place. If they just type in Strong Men, Dangerous Times, or Jim Ramos, they can find us. Uh, and I recommend that people do uh, go out of your way to find these books. And the digital cocaine man in me says find the printed version. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you'll learn more. You'll you'll learn more. And if you live in a country seriously where you just can't get the printed version, get the e version. That's the best. That's the next best thing that you can do. Appreciate All it. right. Let sure. Let's continue on. Too many males defer their role as a man to others. Sadly, our society doesn't applaud a man. It presses in against him. It tells him that the best way to be a man is to become a woman, or worse yet, to be gender neutral. It's easy to take a knee, take a seat, and take it easy. But men don't take shortcuts. They don't coast. They commit to the climb. You know, it's really interesting, Brad. I was just reading in Scripture the other day where in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and Paul's talking and telling Timothy to press in, to lean in, to fight, to do the battle. And he's, then he continues and he says, hey, I fought the good fight. And what I've realized is only dead things drift downstream. If you're going to fish, you're not going to catch a fish floating on top, dripping, drift, drifting downstream. That fish is going to be facing head up against the current. He's going to be swimming. He's being moving. He's active. And living things don't drift. Only dead things drift. And so this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a man who is willing to go against the grain, swim against the current, climb against the gravity, He's willing to put his boots on the ground and move and work and sweat because whenever you go against the current or against gravity or against the grain, you are now battling resistance and forces forces that want to push you back down the mountain. But manhood is a climb. Leadership is a climb. It's a grind, quite frankly. Any man, any true man will tell you life is hard being a man. The easiest thing in the world is to become a dead thing floating down the river full of males. I was uh, recently in Florida a couple of times, and I was at a Teen Challenge Center. And Jim, over the last several years, I've come to realize that as I stand in front of these audiences, particularly when I'm in schools or in front of young adults, Mm -hmm. and i got all these kids out there, it's come to me, and I believe it's from the Lord. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. I may be the only dad they have that year for an hour. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm going to talk to them straight. I'm going to love them deeply. I was at this teen challenge center not long ago. And um, I love going to these places where these kids are getting their lives right with God. And they're so raw. They tell it like it is. They're broken. Mm -hmm. This one kid was sitting out there though. And his hair was all disheveled. And I banter with kids all the time. And that's just how, you know, we do this. And that's how they, that's why they like you. But I looked at him and said, what's the matter with your hair? You just, it's just disgusting. And he goes, oh, I had it up in a bun this morning. And I looked around and I, said, and I, I turned really serious and I said, don't, don't, don't wear your hair in a bun. Be, be a man. <laughs> yeah. and, said, and don't wear skinny jeans either. And uh, all the guys in there go, ooh. And, you know, afterwards he came up and hugged me. You know, he wasn't mad at me at all. We had, we had great banter. But uh, I, I'm saying that to empower some other people. It's in our nature, isn't it, Jim? I, all this crazy feminization of us, I've had, I mean, for a long time, you and I both have had it up to here. And I decided a long time ago, I'm just going to talk like this everywhere I go. And when I sin, I will repent. And as long as I repent when I do sin, God will allow me to keep going. I'm not trying to sin, but I know that if I'm going to be a man like I want to be a man, occasionally 
things will happen. <laughs> it probably shouldn't. But uh, what say you about me telling these boys to not be wearing their hair up in a bun? Well, first of all, banter is the love language of men. So when yep. you give me, when Jesus said, oh, you're the sons of thunder, you know, he probably was saying that sarcastically, but what a great compliment that we've been speaking those words for 2000 years. You're the stone, you know, Jesus used nicknames to identify guys. I love to use nicknames. I, I love to banter back and forth. When when I'm bantering with a guy and he's bantering me with me, that's that's a love language for guys. So the the CRT world's got everything turned around. I had two kids I coached in football several years ago, and they were they were studs, man. Offensive guard, offensive tackle. One was a a big Mexican kid or Hispanic, however, what do you whatever want to say? Uh, he would say was Mexican. He was sec English as a second language guy, Mexican kid. Another kid was a white kid. And I just called them Chocolate Thunder and White Lightning. Man, they loved it. They loved those nicknames. I had kids going, Coach, give me a nickname. And I realized, man, people would get angry about that. And yeah. so it's important for us to, you know, when we begin to banter and talk smack to each other, I mean, man, joyful is the day that a wife starts doing that with her husband. My wife smacks, talks smack to me. I'm like, dude, I love you more. So that's important. And I think that a lot of these guys are being raised in a culture that does not understand what manhood is. And so we really need to help them to understand. Just like when I was a young man, I was told, don't put your hat in the church or, you know, keep your hair below your ears. I mean, the older generation is always telling the younger generation what they think manhood looks like. Now, I realize that men are all different. They come in different shapes, different sizes, different colors. But men have to teach other men what a man is. Women can't do that. And I've seen that. I've seen these boys that are raised by uh, lesbian couples. And man, these boys are, it's sad. It is so yeah. sad because their role model of masculinity is not a man. Jim, I, I wrote uh, not long ago a section in my book on rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is a contagion where these kids are being celebrated by their parents for transitioning. Mm -hmm. So they'll throw a party, for example, in the home. They'll stream it live on YouTube, they'll invite 10 or 15 of their friends over. And in one fell swoop, 10 of them will say, I want to do the same thing. You know, it's, it's peer pressure. And then many of them are going off and having breast augmentation. They're having testosterone shots, puberty blockers, all these things. The, the enemy of our souls has, has been allowed to come into the church. And, you know, judgment begins with us. And one of the reasons why I'm cheering you on right now, and I want every man uh, watching this to consider finding Jim. There's his email address or his uh, web address, and you can contact him. Get in the groups and and just get in the groups. And there's some other good good ministries out there. I'm not just saying that Jim and mine. You know, we, we're talking about our ministries. There are a lot of good ones out there, but of the ones that I deal with, there's a certain segment of men who need uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> to borrow. Uh, a phrase from the loonies, a safe space where they can just open up and, and just let it out, you know, yeah. and then they'll yeah. have real men to come along to sort them out, straighten them out, but love them at, with equal intensity. So men in the arena.org, make sure you find him, man. I know you've got some broken places that you've never talked about it. And probably for good reason, there's nobody that you can trust, but here's a, a ministry that I want you to get connected with because you can trust them. And, uh, and I, I don't give out my trust easily, um, but it's been earned with Jim. Didn't take much, to be honest with it. Uh, as soon as I met it, you, man. Jim, I knew. But there it is, guys. All right, Jim, let's, let's keep going. Uh, this awesome book. Next quote. I walked to the end of the table. It's a powerful story that Jim tells in his book. And Jim, I want you to tell the whole story. I walked to the end of the table and lifted it high in the air, sending every trophy crashing onto the floor in an explosion of marble, wood, and plastic. What in the world was that all about? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Hold on one second. So this is the only trophy I have left. It was that, the most, that survived? most, yeah, most courageous on my college football team, Santa Clara University. You can notice the marble base is missing. Yep. There's no marble base. And what happened uh -huh. is I was giving an illustration to my youth group, and I was going through, I had all my trophies. Back when I was playing sports, we give trophies for accomplishment, and not participation. And so I had trophies. I had about 40 <laughs> trophies. I earned every one of them. Athlete, two times athlete of the year at my high school, all state football, all state basketball, county MVP in football. I had all these 
trophies, baseball trophies, football trophies, basketball trophies, if you can believe it. I was actually quite a rebounder back before I hit puberty and my muscles showed up. Uh, and I'm going through, and I'm kind of bragging about all these trophies. And they're sitting on an eight foot long church table. And then I read in Philippians chapter three, where Paul is going through his, all of his accolades and accomplishments and says, and I consider them rubbish that I may know Christ. And I came, it was, it was a glorious act of, it was beautiful. I lifted that table and all those trophies slid down and exploded. I mean, literally every one of them. I mean, I threw them all the way after that night, but I kept this one because this one was very special to me because it spoke to my heart and not my accomplishments. But all of that was to say, listen, guys, you can have the most beautiful wife on the block. You can have the biggest house on the hill. You can have more dogs than anybody else. You may have more toys than anybody else. I mean, you may have hit the big time and you may have everything that you've ever imagined. But it is all wood, hay and stubble apart from knowing Jesus Christ, your Lord. The most important journey in your life is to pursue Christ. He is the greatest trophy. The beautiful thing about this is God has wired men to pursue trophies. He's made us to conquer. He's made us to win. He's made us to get trophies, but we have to pursue the right ones and the right trophy. Look, I've got a trophy buck over here. Everything around here is things that are there things I've done that I'm proud of. But the ultimate thing in my life, the number one thing and the only thing that matters is my pursuit of Jesus. The problem, Brad, is we've created a culture that says, oh, Jesus is so needy. He wants you so bad. He, God loves you so much. He hung his son on the cross that all you have to do is pray a simple prayer. If you pray a simple prayer, you're in the club. So we make Christianity so weak and weak sauce and so easy to obtain that we have people praying prayers and walking away. But really, Christianity is a radical devotion. It, Christianity wrecked my life. God changed everything everything about where I was heading when I gave my life to Jesus. It is disruptive. Christianity is an interloper on the soul. It changes everything, everything. And it is so hard. It is so hard because you instantly enter this minority group called Christians that make up about one out of every 15 or 20 people on, on this planet. And, and, and you're instantly attacked for these radical views like married to one woman all your life, serving one God who's the only way to heaven, you know, giving your money away, giving your money away in order to get stuff. It's so paradoxical. And so we really need to let people realize that this is not a desperate God who needs you. This is a loving God who made you and includes you. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, he said, if you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. When I read the story about those trophies. Um, the reason why I put that quote up there for those of us that have had those trophies and I have too, the years, the agony, the sweat, the labor, the sacrifice, only people who've been in that arena understand could really relate to taking a whole table full of trophies that were earned I mean, there's no monetary value on the substance mm -hmm. that they were made of. Yeah. But you can't put a price tag on the sweat value of those things. And you were willing to pick them up, trash them. And that is very reflective of an internal, internal work that God has done in your heart. You're a man. Yeah. You're a man. Well, and I, I want to I say I'm sorry that you've only earned two. <laughs> Why? you said you said i've i've earned some i've earned two i'm like really that's pathetic no, man. I had more than that I, I, if I, that was a I oh, man, I, come on that. i'm just talking smack to you I'm no, just messing listen, with you. I, you, you, you you and your I'll, two trophies well that's one more listen, than me that's one more than I'll, me i'll get i'll get back I'll get, I'll get you back. You, you, you have hey, a go. I don't care. Hey, listen, I'll here's what you do. Answer. Here's what you do. When your kids go play soccer, and just keep one of the participation. By the way, yourself. soccer is not a sport. But let's just get that clear up right now. Soccer is not a well, sport. All right, if, go ahead. If, listen, all I have to say about that is if you can call a sport something that you don't even use your hands for, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. I call that like treading water or something. I don't know. I don't know if I call that a sport, but yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. My kids played well, soccer until they actually started playing sports. So, yeah. Well, I had to tone that one down because the truth is that at our age, and you and I are the same age, essentially, I'm 57, you're 56. 
we didn't grow up with soccer in those days. Correct. It was not an American thing. And and these kids have. And so I've uh, I, that joke works well amongst people our age. But I have toned it down amongst the kids. Well, but, I will uh, say this. I will say this. I really do enjoy watching the World Cup. And when I, these big soccer events, I don't watch soccer regularly. I don't watch any sports really regularly. But but the women are tougher. The women, soccer is the sport where the women are tougher than the men. These men yeah. are flopping and faking and their dreadlocks are flying all over. And these women are like bloody and just going for it. So I like watching women's soccer. I think they're tougher. Well, you know what I like to watch? I like to watch MMA, women's MMA. And uh, I was I was speaking at an Iron Sharpens Iron uh, conference. I was doing a breakout session. And, you know, all this talk about the digital cocaine, they were, just, they were asking me, what about sports? Is sports addictive? And um, I'm like, yeah, it sure is. I mean, on television especially, uh, less so if you go play it, but it can be. And then they said, well, what sport do you like? And I'm in a men's conference. So I'm thinking, if I tell them what I really like, I'm, they're – they'll probably boo me because there's a bunch of millennials there, but I just want to, I just said, all right, MMA <laughs> and the place went, yeah. <laughs> so I realized I, I was in good company and it gave them permission to like MMA publicly as well. Apparently they do, but wouldn't want to say it, but, but oh, I did. That's all funny. right. <laughs> that's funny. All right. Well, let's, let's go to the next quote. Um, Jen, this is just powerful stuff here. Underline this. You write, unless you are obedient, to God's general plan in the Bible, you'll struggle to uncover his personal plan or mission for your life. Yeah, that's really important. So I, I've, when I was a youth pastor, I had kids come to all the time. They'd say, hey, I don't understand what God's will for my life is. I don't understand. I'd say, well, stop sleeping with your girlfriend. Stop smoking marijuana. Stop doing drugs. Because if we are disobedient to God, generally speaking, and not living in obedience to the Word of God, to the best of our ability, how can we ever expect Him to unveil His mission for our life? First of all, our back is turned towards Him because we're engaged in open rebellion against Him. And so we have to obey the general principles of the Bible first. For example, if you're a single guy, don't have sex until you're married. Don't live with your girlfriend until you're married. You know, these are critical things. Don't get drunk. Don't use drugs. Don't gossip. Don't sw don't cuss. You know these these general things that all Christians should practice in order to walk. You know, attend a local church, serve in that local church. You know, all of these things to to practice general Christianity. And as we pursue those things, like I said in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven says, you know, trust the Lord. Or it says, um, oh gosh, what does it say? I just blanked on that verse. <laughs> Jeremiah 20, I have for you. yeah for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans not to not to harm you but to prosper you to give you hope and a future two verses later it says if you seek me with all your heart I will let you find me so this is what we're saying in order for us to really understand what God's specific plan for our life is we need to walk in obedience to God's general plan or the overall the overarching theme for all believers perfectly said it's so simple, but the reason why I picked that out is because I, I float in every circle imaginable. I mean, we mm -hmm. live amongst Mennonites and some Amish here, and I, I minister to the even some of the old order Mennonites. And then I go into the trendy churches with the fog machines and everything in between. And um, that struck me because in the charismatic groups, they want a constant fresh word from yep you know, the wind blowing at the right moment and all this sort of stuff to the neglect of the hard slog that it takes to dissect verse by verse Genesis to the book of the revelation, which is the absolute most important revelation yeah. from God that you'll ever get. And that, that was an excellent, excellent quote. All right. On to the next one. Nowhere did Jesus say to make decisions for him. Nowhere did he say to go into millions of dollars of building debt, water down the gospel message, and count converts. It must sadden the heart of God to listen to people boast about their churches more than Jesus. We've trained people to become invitalists instead of evangelists. Yeah, this is a. I, I'm. I think we're going to look back, Brad, and I might be upsetting some people now. I just wrote in my own personal journal a couple of days ago. I think in a hundred years we're going to look back on this generation, and there's a heresy that's run through our our churches prior for the last sixty years. I'm not going to tell you what I think that heresy is called, but I'll tell you what I think it's founded in. It's founded in creating an environment 
where Christ followers get excited about bringing their friends to church, where they hear a message that just says, if you pray this prayer, you're in the club. And nowhere in Scripture did Jesus ever command that. In fact, nobody ever commanded that. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, Paul says, if you believe in your heart, Christ raised from the dead, or if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess to your mouth, Christ raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's a radical statement that, that means a total alterca- alteration of your life. It's saying, I'm going to believe. I'm going to give everything to this new belief. My whole life is going to change. It has nothing about praying a sinner's prayer. Now, have I had people pray a sinner's prayer? Yes. I've had them do that to give them a date on the calendar. But before that, I said, hey, this is going to cost you everything. We need to be very truthful about this. And so it's not about, again, it goes back to an earlier question, Brad. It's not about me inviting you to church. We just had Easter where hundreds and thousands and thousands of people were invited to churches all around our world. It's not about becoming a great inviter. It's about Christians becoming interlopers into the lives of their people and telling them about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. It's my job to be an evangelist for Jesus. It's my job to share my faith with others. Yes, the church is a great tool for me to bring my friends in or to help disciple my friends, but it's my job to do that. So when we teach our people, all they have to do is invite them to church. It's kind of the underlying message is is really deceitful because those same churches say, hey, listen, if you just bring your wife to the women's group or if you bring your children to children's church or your teens to youth church, we're just going to take care of you. And the underlying message is the church will take care of you. And, and that is great. And I love my church. I'm very involved in my local church. But the but men have a mantle that we have to carry. We're the ones who are in charge of discipling our children and making sure they grow up into the ways of the Lord. We're the ones who are supposed to love and, and, and honor our wives. We're the ones that are supposed to serve. We're the ones that are supposed to lead the way in evangelism. And that's where the message has got a little bit mixed up in the last 60 years. It sure has. And I, I just want to backtrack just a minute. I'm not down on the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, me neither. Speaks. Me either. I'm Pentecostal. Uh, so I have a right to pick on charismatics because I'm one of them. Um, but I will be, I'm old, I'm very old school though. The Word of God is the preeminent thing ever. And everything, every experience, everything must be judged. And if mm-hmm. it doesn't match, it must be dismissed immediately. And that's where I'm coming from. And I know, Jim, you would not disparage anyone who's prayed a sinner's prayer so long no. as it was sincere and because you don't have to know all the perfect words and 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 all these sorts of little you know spooky things it just needs to be sincere to come to God and then you learn yeah. over time but but no I, I hear you loud and clear well and all I right, would well, say I'm I would not, just I would add one more thing Brett I think that sure. praying that sinner's prayer is a mile marker it's a monument that somebody establishes and they can say that was the day I did it but they need to have the right information. So I agree with you 100%. I think the mile marker is important. And I I will also say that uh, if I recall correctly, it's been a long time now, I probably prayed the sinner's prayer a hundred times before one day it took. Yeah. And I don't know why that was, but, you know, God in his providence and his sovereignty, I'm, I'm, I'm Calvinist on one end, Arminian on the other, and I got it all mixed together, and I believe it all. Well, I'm, I'm I'm right in the middle of all that. So well, it's really interesting because Jesus taught us to pray, "Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven." That is a that's Hebrew parallelism. It's two lines explain each other. So every day I should pray, God, I want your kingdom in heaven to be the same kingdom in my heart. So every day Jesus told us to pray the sinner's prayer. So right. we should be praying that every day, God, I want your kingdom, I want your spirit, I want all of you, I surrender. Well, I'll speak for me. It's because I sin every day. Uh, hey, buddy, I need it too, man. I need it. Or as D.L. Moody said, you know, we got a constant quote talking about Ephesians where it says, keep on being filled because yeah. we're leaky. <laughs> we yeah, leak. Ephesians 5.18. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. All right. Uh, final quote that I have, and you're welcome uh, to, to throw any extras in if you would like to, but page 142 from the awesome book, Strong Men, Dangerous Times, Five Essentials Every Man Must Possess to change his world. Life is messy. Marriage is messy. Your job is messy. Your church is messy. Put on the servant towel of Jesus and start cleaning up the messes. 
Yeah, you know, when I was younger, when I first gave my life to Christ, it was a radical shift. I sold everything I had and went to follow him. I just took everything literally. Life was so easy when I was 22 to 26. A single guy, it was black and white. It was this or that. It was you do or you don't. And then I got married. And then I had kids. And then I started experiencing life. And I started seeing the pain that people went through that I didn't feel deserved it. And, and life became a little bit more gray to me. And the scripture, I loosened my grip on the legalistic side of scripture. And I've realized that life is messy, very, very messy. Great parents can raise horrible children. Great people can go through horrible experiences. And it's our job as believers to clean up the messes. It, it really is. I, I, and I, I tend to lean over that. I have to really battle to stay away from the legalistic side because, you know, you and I are, are out there preaching a message to men and, and they need boldness and they need declarations and they need men to stand up where our world has gotten really watered down and to say, listen, I'm going to make a bold claim here. And so we have to make some of those bold claims but I also realize that in the middle of a bold claim, there's a lot of wiggle room often. And we've got to be really um, aware of that to be willing to give the grace for people to walk through their messes as we come alongside them and clean up with them. Jim, uh, man, I, I was just thinking a few minutes ago, as you were talking about when you were, w elaborated on the CRT issue. And the revival, you, you called it a revival. Yeah. I, I said that too. The Marxists, the neo-Marxists, the culture of Marxists are having a revival. It's an inverse Absolutely. revival. It's a demonic revival. Yeah. We, we and, and it has, uh, you know, emasculated men. I mean, it's it's put all this toxic masculinity on. I did this thing last week, a couple weeks ago. I was up in Sterling, Virginia. Surely, out where you are, you've heard of Loudoun County, Virginia. It's, it's a slice of... Washington State and Oregon, right here in Virginia, up in oh really? Washington. Oh, it, the but the left wing loons have taken over up there. the The reason why I say that it's it, it's full of um, left wing progressives who've gotten into the school system that have put the gay agenda, LGBTQ, and all the other letters into the schools and all the textbooks about you know masturbation and all that stuff. Finally, a bunch of uh, mama bears rose up, and it's been an, all in the national news here and. Some in, in our government, the FBI was going to label some of these parents terrorists because they disagreed. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and they may have. But I mean, they were threatening that to get them to try to get them to calm down. Of course, when a mother is good and ticked off, good luck with that. And I don't believe in mm -hmm. luck. Thank God. Anyway, I was just thinking you and I should probably get together and do a show on Marxism and the revival that's taking place to re-empower men because it's going to take men of God to combat this. You, we, it, we cannot just sit back. We're going to lose our country, but that that's another rabbit trail. Um, but I just appreciate your bold stand on all these things. And Jim, I want to close this way, unless you have something that you want to say. Um, I just in my heart, as I've followed you on Facebook and I, I don't have, that's the only social media that I'm left with. Yeah. So I know you, you have other avenues. I'm not against that. It's just for me, it was wasting too much of my time. So I've, I've kept Facebook. That's and why I, I pay somebody to do it all. Yeah, that's yeah. – <laughs> yeah, so you put your dirt on them. I'm just kidding. Don't, yeah, don't, totally. Don't, don't, don't you hit me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, there are men watching this. I'm trusting that the Lord is going to bring men to this podcast that are, that are a mess. Uh, life is messy. Your marriage is messy. Porn has, you know – caused you to go to places that um, if people were to look inside your brain would call you all kinds of names, all that. But you found yourself watching this and you, you're seeing a couple of, of guys who uh, are, are, are not ashamed to say that they're men, but they also have love. They have love mm -hmm. for God and they have love for other men who are struggling like this because, well, we have. Jim, would you talk to that man, share the gospel with him, whatever you want to do, and then we'll conclude in a few minutes. I want you to pray. I just want you to conclude with prayer. I just, I'm going to turn it over to you and just let you okay. minister to these guys. Yeah. And then I'm going to help them again, find you and find your, your ministry. So would you do that? Yeah. I would just say, you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter eight, there is nothing that we are more than conquerors and there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing you've done, 
nothing you will do, nothing can separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that you've done. You may have guilt. You may have shame. You may have neglect. You may have ignored those people that you love. But it's not how you've started that matters. It's not even how you are now. What matters is finishes. Finishes matter to God. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the power of God for the salvation of all. And basically there is no shame here. Romans 8.1 says, for there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we have to let go of the past. Philippians 3.12 and 14 says, forgetting what is behind, I press on to the prize. So what I would say to the guys out there today is this, press on, start today and move forward one step at a time. And the way you do it, in my opinion, after 32 years of ministry now, the best way I have seen men take one step in front of the other is to find a community of guys who you can lock shields with. Find some guys, find a small group, find a support group, find something. If you're addicted to alcohol or pornography, find a group for that. If you're a guy who just needs support, Find uh, there are many, many ministries like Men in the Arena out there to support you. Find a group. We offer virtual groups. We offer local groups. Find a ministry that will support you. Find a church where you can connect into a community of guys that really care about you. You know, um, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 talks about let us consider how to love one another on or let, let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And so it's very important that we don't forsake gathering together but that we find a community of people who are like us, who maybe are struggling with the same things, and they're willing to lock shields with us. They're willing to pull out the servant's towel and clean up the mess behind us as we use our servant's towel to clean up the mess behind them. It's a two-way street, guys. And a lot of times what happens is we get so used to having people clean up our messes we forget to put the servant's towel on, John 13, and to clean up the messes for others. That is so important. And so I just want to, I feel like uh, led to pray for the guys out there right now that have a mess in their life. And they think their mess has hindered them from becoming who they should be. And I would just say, when you plug into a community, when you plug in to a body of Christ that loves and supports you, God turns your tragedies into trophies he turns your mess into his message. Romans 8, 28, for God works all things out for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And as you begin to walk and lock shields other men, he will take your tragedies, turn them into your trophies. Lord, I just lift up this group of, group of guys today for any guys that are hurting, for any guys that are broken, for any guys that are addicted, for any guys that are wrestling with uh, uh, years maybe of wrong choices. Uh, God, I pray that you would lead these guys to a community of men who genuinely love them, who are authentic, who are, who are vulnerable, who carry the servant's towel, and that these men listening would plug in. They don't have to go through this life alone, but give them a community of guys, five, six, 12 guys to walk with them, and that these guys would be bold and make a bold move and to become an interloper themselves and to invade a space with other men and say, listen, I want to be a part of this tribe. I want to have my darkness pushed back, and I'm going to trespass into your group, and I'm going to hope and pray that you let me in. So God, I pray boldness over these guys, that they would walk in that faith and walk in that space, and so that through the locking of shields, they will become their best version for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Jim, you are absolutely awesome, and I, I love and appreciate you very much, and uh, just can't speak enough about your ministry. I want to put the cover of your book up again and encourage men to get this. Strong men, dangerous times, five essentials every man must possess to change his world. You can find this on Amazon. You can go to the website that I have been putting up uh, of Jim's, and I will put that back up there and as soon as I can, uh, as soon as I can find it. Uh, that's mine, bradhuddleston.com. If you, a lot of people watching this already know how to find me. If you can't find Jim and his book, and if you want to get in touch with his ministry, just email me. Just go to bradhuddleston.com and click at the link at the top of the contact button. And uh, if you have any messages that you want to get to him through me, you can do that. But uh, Jim's uh, web address 
uh, is men in the arena.org is a number of ways to find him. And again, his book is strong men, dangerous times, subtitled five essentials. Every man must possess to change his world. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for all of your time and what you represent and what you do. I hope you'll join me again sometime. Oh, hey, you too, man. When that book comes out, I want to get you back on here. I love what you're doing. It's so, so desperately needed. And we're we're both working with the same groups, but totally different needs. So it's pretty fun to lock shields with you. And man, uh, God bless your ministry. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, thanks for mentioning that book. Uh, It is called Digital Rehab, subtitled Digital Detox and Beyond. So it's a follow up to digital cocaine. Digital cocaine uh, exposed the problem and you graciously had me on your podcast and it's tremendous feedback from your podcast. Thanks for allowing me in front of your audience. And I'm committed to you, Jim, that with this next book, we're going to go to the next level of deliverance with them as well and stick with them and journey with them and love them unconditionally because that's how God loves us. Amen. I, pr- I believe it. Thanks so much, man. All right, Jim. Love you, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Amen. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.